Would you not? Oops. All right, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this month's um, meeting. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late and um, 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 we have a very special speaker, but before then, can I just ask the National Secretary to lead us in an opening prayer? Yeah, thank you, Uncle Ife. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and thanks for um, joining us for another night you know, for our um, advocacy program or advocacy group on persecution. And then um, we trust that the Lord will help us tonight. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor you. We appreciate you, Lord, for the time that you've given us to be able to gather together and fellowship with one another. But thank you that it is because of the cross that we can gather together as brothers and sisters. And we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy to be able to gather with you and with one another. And we just pray that your presence will fill this meeting, oh Lord. Your presence will fill our individual homes where we, where we are. We just want God to move in our midst tonight in the name of Jesus. We're praying for your son that you need to use to minister to us, that you will speak through him as your oracle, O oh Lord. We pray that you anoint him, O oh Lord, anoint his lips, O oh Lord, and he will declare your counsel in the name of Jesus. And Amen. the words that we hear, here tonight <clears throat> will stir up faith in us to be able to stand for the persecuted church, to be a voice for the persecuted church, to intercede, O oh Lord, for fellow brothers and sisters who are out there lifting the banner of righteousness, even in the midst of stiff opposition and persecution, O oh Lord. And we are praying, O oh Lord, even for them right now, that you will minister your peace to them in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray, Father, your grace will be sufficient for them. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, that Jesus will be their advocate in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, that you will indeed help them, O oh Lord, to be liberated, O oh Lord. That as a people of God, we are lifting our voices to you, just like the church in the early days lifted their voice to you when Peter was arrested and Peter was released, was freed, oh Lord. So we are lifting up our voices, oh Lord, for our brethren who have been persecuted in Nigeria and in other parts of the world for divine intervention for them in the name of jesus Amen. i want to also use this opportunity to pray for peace over ukraine right now in the name of jesus Amen. over the christians Amen. over there and the people of the land oh lord that you will divinely intervene you will speak your peace oh lord and there will be peace on all side Amen. in the name of jesus Amen. where the lord will make a way Amen. Even in this difficult situation. Thank Amen. you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we'll pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Tunji. Um, um, just one or two announcements. Um, normally, we have an interchange. Um, um, so on odd, odd months like January, March, uh, May, July, we have a speaker. And on even months like February, April, June, we have a prayer meeting. But uh, we changed it around for January and February, and we hope to return to the routine again in March. So January, we had a prayer meeting, and February, we had a speaker. So we hope to have another speaker in March. Um, um, but it's, again, just to remind everyone, it's on the last Sunday of every month, 8 p.m. Nigerian time. Um, and um, because I've had a few technical problems again today, Bratunji will kindly view raise hands and take the questions after after our main speaker has spoken. He will be introduced much later on. But as a sign of 
the extremely wonderful support that the OFNC Advocacy Group on Persecution receives from the National Executive Council. We've had a chairman in every month, whether it's a prayer meeting or uh, a speaker speaking. And today we just want to invite um, our chairman, Professor John Drodola, to give us his opening remarks. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Brother Ife. On behalf of the Overseas Fellowship of Nigerian Christians, I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to everyone to our advocacy meeting for this month. Uh, we thank God for the awareness we are getting through it, which we believe is uh, causing us in small ways to uh, start to do what the Lord enables us to do uh, for the persecuted church, especially in Nigeria. We thank you for taking this to heart. Um, as individuals, um, there are not many of us today, but we pray that those of us who are here will be uh, blessed enough uh, that the work of God through us will continue to um, march on. Uh, today's topic has, uh, has been advertised as reconciliation between faith groups in Nigeria. Uh, We'll be listening to our brother uh, later on about this. But I, as I was reflecting to us this evening, it just occurred to me to uh, say to us that persecution leaves so many orphans, it leaves widows, it leaves widowers, and leaves a lot of trauma. And we know that our God, even though he tells us we, we suffer uh, persecution, our God is also a God of comfort. <clears throat> And he wants us to comfort uh, people. Uh, we know from James, James 1.28, the true religion is this, that uh, we uh, comfort uh, the orphan, uh, the widows, and to support all who are in distress. Uh, well, fancy takes this to heart. Okay. That's why we have okay. this uh, meetings, and the Lord is helping us to understand more. And uh, we are engaging uh, by the grace of God, uh, working with the collaborators, working with okay, people who are on the ground in Nigeria, especially. So I'd like to take this time to thank uh, Brother Mark Libdo. You have been to OFNC uh, before. You left uh, a great positive impression when I uh, had opportunity to listen to you. And I was looking towards this evening with a great uh, expectation of what the Lord will use you to expose to us. I'm praying that the Lord will help us to do uh, what he wants with what we will hear. And we pray for Stefano's foundation that the Lord will strengthen you, that the Lord will cause the ministry to prosper and bring um, release to, to his people. Amen. We know uh, with assurance from the Lord that the church of God is marching on and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. So, um, Brother Efe, thank you for giving me opportunity to uh, welcome everyone and to uh, just say that our heart as Overseas Fellowship of Nigerian Christians is on um, doing everything God enables us to do for the uh, persecuted church, especially in Nigeria. And we thank God for those people on ground. Uh, we will join forces with you uh, by the grace of God. Thank you. Thank you. And may I uh, take this opportunity to thank um, uh, David and Gwyneth, um, uh, someone who went to a mission school, so may the Lord bless you for your work in Nigeria and thank you for still standing with us. God bless. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you so very much, um, um, Chairman Professor John Drodola. As I said earlier on, I think you might have missed that. Um, those who didn't arrive earlier, that the chairman hasn't missed one meeting of the advocacy group on persecution, and that takes place on last Sunday of every month. So everyone else, 
can please take note at 8 p.m. We've had some really interesting speakers and sometimes we have prayer sessions and um, a lot of the sessions are currently on our YouTube channel, the old www uh, which you can find on our website www.ofnc.org.uk there's a link to the youtube gallery and if you go to youtube gallery you'll see a lot of our previous speakers and um i hope you can join and i hope that it blesses you i know that persecution is one of the topics we that fills our hearts with great joy because we are suffering like our brothers and sisters are suffering and it is in that mode that i would like to welcome um um mr mark lipto who um <clears throat> i found out he's an engineer so he his calling was from a completely different profession but now he works in joss a city which i spent a year in joss and i i've had really fun memories of being in joss for that year but particularly because when i spoke to someone about 2011-12 they told me that joss had changed remarkably from what it was in 1984 when i was there for a year so um Engineer Mark Lipto would like to welcome you. We thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We apologize for the many technical issues that have um, um, caused a lot of delays, but please speak. And then after speaking, anyone who has questions, please feel free to ask those questions. And Brother Tunji will um, do my job and be the moderator during the question and answer period. But over now to you, sir, to hear what you have to say on reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the privilege and the opportunity for having me here. I, I greet my father there, uh, Dr. Carling, uh, who has been with us. He has been someone who started me up here in Nigeria, and he's still with us. Uh, just last week, we clocked 20 years in uh, supporting the persecuted church in Nigeria, and we're still ready and willing to go on. So thank you for the privilege. I thank all of you at OFNC since we connected in 2011, 2012. We have been on. You've invited me, like uh, Brother Dirodola said, you've invited me several times to your conferences in uh, UK, and uh, we've linked with you in so many advocacy efforts uh, in, in UK and even here on ground. So thank you for the privilege. Thank you also for sending support. I remember OFNC Birmingham have been relentless in helping. They've sent uh, money to uh, rebuild a uh, center, Christian Center for Discipleship and uh, Missions, which was burned down completely. Uh, now is functioning. So thank you for that effort. Uh, we thank those of Lancaster who are still supporting. Uh, just this evening, we received uh, two barrels full of clothes from all FNC in Lancaster. So, bro, Sister Anna sent that through, and I just received that this evening. So, thank you very much for your relentless support. Uh, just quickly, because of the technical issue, I don't, I don't want to take time so much uh, on speaking because I realize some of us, uh, most of us, are packed full of questions to ask. Um, and in looking at the topic, reconciliation between faiths in Nigeria, uh, I can imagine, especially looking at uh, the team that brought this topic, uh, being advocacy team of OFNC, Overseas Fellowship of Nigerian Christians, I, will, as I can see what you are imagining. And your guess is like mine. When you talk about reconciling faith in Nigeria, you will begin to imagine what can we do uh, so that the, all the faiths in this country will come at peace and continue to work together and create the atmosphere for uh, the country to uh, continue to exist in peace. But when you look at that, uh, you say reconciling, reconciliation, some of us who are on ground, we find it very, very difficult. How possible can that be? That is the big question that every day we battle with in existing in this country. And in order to look at that, as I was praying, God led me to uh, the Bible passage. And as Christians, we cannot do without um, looking at references. 
And so I pick my reference from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to 21. For those who can turn to the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to 21. And I read, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as others will think, it is so unto God, because we have given ourselves to God. If we are in our mind, for Christ's love compel us, because we are convinced that one man died for all. And therefore, all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way but we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Traditionally, we've come to be known as a country that has the northern part belonging to the Hausas, the southeast belonging to the Igbos, and southwest to the Yorubas. But that has come to be a false belief. So if you are to look at the ethnic, traditional ethnic religion, hello, am I on? Hello? Yes, you're yes. on, we can hear you. Ah, okay. So when we are trying to now define the traditional religious belief in Nigeria, we may be tempted to look at the religion that guides the Northern people and the religion that guides the Southeast and the religion that guides the Southwest. That is to say, what is the major religion that rules over the North, the Hausa people? What is the religious belief of the Igbos? And what is the religious practice of the Yorubas? Now, if you are defining on that ground, you will want to cluster people and their beliefs in those three basic areas. But we in the Middle Belt have come to find out that it's impossible. Immediately when you begin to define us as houses, then there is that reaction. We are not houses. Why? Because we are not Muslims. And we are all ethnic people. And in 19 Northern states, our research has come up with 673 ethnic groups who speak different about 450 dialects. So if you want to paint the diversity of just the North, you will find out that there are over 1,100 ethnic traditional beliefs. So you can see how complex that will be if you try to look at reconciliation in that regards. So 
to say that the whole East belong to Igbos and the West belong to Yorubas and the, all that, it, it, it's, it's not true. So we have come to estimate that there are over 800 ethnic groups in Nigeria. And thus, there are over 800 customs, traditions, and hence, hence traditional religious beliefs and practices in Nigeria. So that is when you are looking at this. So if you are to reconcile the traditional people and ethnic people in Nigeria based on their beliefs, there's going to be a very, very complex approach to that. And then we look at Islam, how Islam came into Nigeria around 1349 and between 1349 and 1385, Islam got uh, the Hausa people through uh, Ali Samia, a very, very fierce warrior who, because of their, his name, he's called even Serkin Yaji. And history added that Serkin Yaji used to go from community to community, forcing people to practice and believe whatever he tells them to believe. And that is how the North became unanimous in taking Islam when Ali turned to be a Muslim by uh, his contact or through his contact with the uh, merchants who have come from Western Sudan. So we discovered that the practice of forcing communities to practice a belief in the North is still existing. And we, that marked the first entry of Islam in Northern Nigeria. And when, because Islam came through the Fulanis, Fulani who are nomads today, continue to rule over the Hausa people using the approach that Serki Yaji used. So they expect that through their belief, once they believe a thing, every person that they rule must believe, uh, have all such a belief. And that is why today, there is no Hausa man that is considered a Muslim enough to be an emir over Hausa people in Northern Nigeria. Until death, it is Fulani that are still ruling over Hausa land. In protest, therefore, the Hausa people have become Shiite Muslims. So there are a lot of factors in Islam that have divided Muslims. And currently in Nigeria, we have the Sunni Muslims, we have the Shiite, we have the Mahmadiyya Muslims, and then we have the Tijaniya Muslims, and then the Izalans. Uh, when I was making this inquiry, somebody told me that there are over 16 sects in this country of Muslims. Quickly, I moved to Christianity, and I don't intend to spend much time because our time is far spent. When Christianity touched base with the Nigerian ports around 1455, eventually it came, actually it came at first through the Catholic merchants, Portuguese Catholic merchants. And so it would have been a Catholic faith that would have been running. But eventually, Christian missions later extend, extended Christianity at different times at, diff, and in, at different parts of this country. And so today, Christianity being, I mean, is being administered under a recognized five blocks of the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN. We have the Catholic denomination, and those are in their numbers also. When you look at the different practices uh, and denominations in Catholicism, you have, uh, you find it difficult that all of them can be reconciled and brought together under one uh, belief. And then we have the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. You will agree with me, there are many Pentecostal churches. In fact, a friend of mine was trying to carry out a research, and he said in Kaduna alone, he came up with over 1,000 Pentecostal churches that are different, and their beliefs and practices are different. They are just clustered under one block called PFN. That in itself is a big task, trying to bring them together under one uh, uh, belief. And so we also look at uh, another block that is 
uh, organization of Africa institutional churches. And those are the celestial churches, Christ Apostolic, the uh, um, Cherubim and Seraphim, and so on. And somebody has said Olumba Olumba is also under OAIC. And in itself, you can agree with me, reconciling the white garment churches is a task. Then we have Equatican churches, which are churches that are uh, instituted by SIM, the activities of missionaries under Sudan Interior Mission and the Sudan uh, United Missions. They are also in number within the Middle Belt. And that form denominations that are hardly being able to bring to be brought together. Uh, Baba Kalim, who, who work with S SUM here in Nigeria, will, uh, will, will bear me witness that even at Tekan, it's very difficult to get all the denominations to agree together. And finally, we have Christian Council of Nigeria, where Baptist, Anglican, and other uh, groups belong. So this is how diverse. So putting traditional religious belief, Islam, and Christianity with their diversity. You will agree with me that any attempt to bring these people together will be very, very difficult in themselves. Just because of their number is a challenge. But if you want to look at it based on their belief, the conflict exists in ground, on the ground that while Christians believe that God gave man the free gift of choice, Muslims see it differently. Muslims believe that there is no religion but Islam and that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger and that Allah is the only sovereign one and only he must be the law giver of Muslims. And so Muslims see that if you are to submit yourself to human or secular system of governance is a form of disregard or denial of the very foundation of their faith. So, and the extremist Muslims see the world as belonging to Allah, and therefore they have right anywhere they can go. And they don't just have right, but they have an obligation to supplant every non-Islamic system and make it subject to Allah. Now, this is the belief of Muslims. If we try to look at the ethnic worldview, you will, you will believe, and those who are Nigeria will understand that while people in Nigeria exist in their diversity, every people have, they see that they have an obligation to defend the land they occupy for social, for economic, and for religious reasons. But the concept of land goes beyond mere territory. Land is part of every ethnic life, and it is a part of their heritage. In fact, the gods and the spirits of the ethnic group are in the trees, they are in the mountains, they are in the rivers and valleys that make up what? The land of the people. And so animals in the forest, the fishes in the rivers constitute the patrimony of the ethnic group that exists in that area. So any land dispute or attempt to take land from an ethnic group is seen as treason against such group. And this can result to serious bloody clashes. So these are the conflicting points of the beliefs and practices of the people we call Nigerians. Now, when you come to the point of reconcil reconciliation of this belief, you can agree with me that you will be facing a very, very huge task. We look back to history and we see that the British faced such huge task at the, the time of amalgamation in 1914. And so in trying to reconcile the people, the B British tried to look at the ethnic people under their customs and traditions. And so the group people, every people group uh, to be controlled 
by what they call the customary laws of the practices of those people. And because there are those who are no longer ethnic people and they felt that they have come to respect Islam, the British also made attempt to make, to understand Islamic law. And so they have a part of Sharia law embedded into the constitution of Nigeria. But then they made sure that there are parts of the, uh, the Islamic law that come with penalties that contravene human rights, that they made sure that they do not include and recognize that in Nigeria. And so when these bodies, the customs and tradition of people come into clash with Islam, the British felt that when such situation happened, the English law and the English way of life should govern over the people and look for fairness in the area of conflict. And when there is ever, ever going to be conflict, the English law is to overrule for fairness. Now, this is the attempt to reconcile the peoples of Nigeria in the past. But when we look at that so far, this is failing. Just at the advent of democracy in the 60s, all of us know that when independence happened and the British were now leaving Nigeria, cracks began to happen. And as time went on, these cracks continued to widen. And that was what brought the civil war in Nigeria and then brought the military rule and just when the world and the international community insisted that Nigeria practice democracy, at the advent of democracy in 1999, we began to see the states in Northern Nigeria make demand for Sharia. And so 12 states in the greater Sharia in the North. Now, those who are conversant with the constitution that brought us that is the body of laws that uh, mediate and administer for fairness within conflicts <clears throat> between the customs and Sharia. That body of law has no place in uh, the immigration of Sharia by the 12 states in the North. And so that began to bring a shake in our uh, staying together as a country. And we began to see those who felt that, no, they are not a Sharia state, they cannot be Sharia state, began to cut off. And most ethnic groups in the Middle Belt cut away from that integration of Sharia in the North. But then that brought a conflict. And those who knew the emergence of the protests in Kaduna that now became uh, a riot in Kaduna and many people were killed because the Christians in Kaduna refused that Kaduna state will not integrate Sharia. And then subsequently we began to see IPOB emerging in the Southeast and then uh, Odibua in the Southwest. And this began the conflict and widening and up to today. But then it gave room to violence. The violent Islamic extremist belief was now being uh, incited against the ethnic people of Northern Nigeria. And we began to see Islamic rioting uh, targeting Christians in Northern states and other ethnic minority groups. Up, up until uh, 2003, when Boko Haram insurgent group started, with uh, Mohammed Yusuf being the leader. And they believed that Islam should rule uh, not just the Northeast, but the whole of the country. But after that, the Fulani terrorist group, the militant Fulani began to emerge because they felt that they are not being heard. Their own interests was not also taken into account. And so the Middle Belt and the Northwest 
and some parts of the East and the West also have been suffering their own Fulani militant terrorism. Uh, and we see that defying every solution on ground, and many people have been hurt on ground. That is what brought Stephanos into existence. We see a lot of effort and approaches by government to try to bring reconciliation. But the question is, has it been successful? We see efforts in, in the area of confidence building. We see so many dialogues. People's groups are being brought together to sit and decide. No sooner that they come together, they begin again to fall apart. There are peace parties here and there that are being instituted by government and other uh, ethnic groups to try and bring peace between their people's groups. We also see truth and reconciliation sessions that are run here and there. Truths and treaties are being signed, but none of these approaches appear to have held in reconciliation between faiths in Nigeria. Now, what then is the true sense of reconciliation? How can we begin to look at reconciling these diverse groups in Nigeria? That takes us to our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 11 to 21. There we see that Christ died. To many people, we don't make sense when we believe in Christ. But that is the mind of God for many who will take on the life of Christ. When Christ came, he, he came at the time of Roman invasion of the Israeli nation. And so Israel had expected that God will send a Messiah and that this Messiah was going to help deal with the Roman uh, occupation of their land. So Jesus came as a little baby, and that's why the Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Today, you and I have come to believe, but there are processes that have brought us to that belief. And those processes are the things that we are to look at. That is what I term reconciliation. And that is what our texts have referred to as reconciliation. The Bible showed us that God was reconciling the world to himself by bringing Jesus. Even though he was a baby, nobody could believe in him. But the death of Jesus left only 12 disciples. If we were to look at those disciples today, we will say Christianity is a failed religion. But something made the belief to expand. And we can see that most followers of Christ have been reconciled back to, Christ, to God. And these ones who have reconciled to God have become the church today. And they are the ones who have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So as Christians, where there is a conflict, we are supposed to represent God. We are supposed to see it as an opportunity to do what? To reconcile people to God. But because how conflict comes, because of how difficult it comes, many of us are not looking at it as opportunity at all. Yes, you will agree with me. Very many lives that have been lost in Nigeria today, you will believe that there is no opportunity in that if you are to look at the killings that are going on in Nigeria today. No one will see it as an opportunity. But then, the gospel under our text expects us to see it as an opportunity. And how can we get to see it? If we look at it, that it is the death of Christ that brought all of us to this belief, then this text tells us that that death demands us to also die. 
And the text also tells us that because one man died, we no longer live for ourselves. We should consider ourselves as dead beings. But you will agree with me that what causes conflict in Nigeria today is because everybody is alive. We are alive to our own interests. We are alive to protect our beliefs. We are alive to protect our properties as against the life of another. And as long as people are alive, the conflict mm -hmm. continues to threaten the people and it continues to broaden. So God expects us to live as ambassadors in the midst of all this. And we should be making uh, his will as ambassadors to come into being. So this conflict, the church is supposed to see it as an opportunity to reconcile men to God. Many have died. If we go back to biblical example, we look at Stephen. How did Stephen die? Stephen was not a criminal. Stephen had done nothing wrong. But because he believed, they targeted him because of his belief, and he was murdered. The Bible told us that while dying, one would feel that such a person should be consumed by anger, he should be consumed by bitterness. But the account tells us that Stephen looked to his persecutors and prayed for them. My question is, in Nigeria today, how many of us can dare to pray for those that we find ourselves in conflict with? How many of us will dare to pray for Muslims, especially when they face the knife? It's very difficult. Many have faced those knives, and I wonder whether they see it as an opportunity. It is because Stephen saw it as an opportunity that we had a young man who supervised the death of Stephen, as we believe, that turned to be a Christian, turned to the faith of Stephen. And we see that many letters written in the Bible today was written by this young man, Saul, who turned and later became a Paul because he took on Stephen's faith. So in this work at Stephanus Foundation, I've come to see that even though it's very difficult, what God expects is that we see it as an opportunity. We should learn to die to everything that people see that we don't uh, deserve to have. And teaching such as, if a man takes your coat, give him. If a man takes your shirt, give him the outer coat so that he fits him well. Those are not popular teachings in our days. Maybe those are the teachings that God expects us to give it to in these days. I can see that in doing that, we will have nothing to fear. But when we are fighting for our land, when we want to segregate our area as Odudua, then it fails us. Because like we see today, even in the, among the Yorubas, the largest cluster of ethnicity, we can see that when you turn to Islam, there are house, um, uh, Yoruba Muslims that will become a mass, much stronger mass with the North because of their faith. When you are looking to Christianity, then you have those who are Christians in the Southwest, cluster with the East, and cluster with some middle belters to form what a mass. And so reconciliation based on my interest will fail us. But reconciliation or relinquishing my interest will win. And this is what I think God wants us to, to turn to. And in turning to it, many of us are angered by a lot of harm that has been done to us. But we see that the method of reconciliation is that God met Jesus, even though he, he knew no sin. He made him sin. 
just because of us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We, we who are sinners, how can we be the righteousness of God? But this is the mystery. Many have wronged us as Christians in this country. Can we take on the position of their sin so that they begin to entertain righteousness in the form that God really wants humanity to look at? So the opportunity here is that God wants to make humanity come to him and be reconciled to do things his own way. And that is why he expects us, when we come together, we should first of all pray, let thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But most of us are alive to our will. Most of us prefer to hold on to our will. And we are, in, we are eaten up by grief against those who have wronged us. We are eaten up by grief against Islam. We are eaten up by grief against each other. And we begin to take on arms and look to violence in order to settle it. All those will fail. So if I am to conclude, reconciling beliefs and faith in Nigeria must take on the godly way that we must we who are Christians, and indeed we are in our numbers, we must learn to take on the principle of reconciliation as given to us by Jesus, the non-violent approach to reconciliation. May God help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Tuji, I thought you were. Uh, or oh, Brother Ife, what, what did you want He's to do? Brother Ife, Uncle Ife, what do you want us to do? Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, good evening. Thank you very much, um, sir, for an excellent talk. It was very challenging because, um, as you rightly said, most people, when facing um, persecution, tend to forget the turn the other cheek principle. We think very much more of the suffering and sometimes of revenge and that kind of stuff. But Jesus has asked us, has, has shown us a completely different way, a completely different kind of focus. And thank you very much for reminding us of that. It is challenging and it is tough sometimes to, um, in the face of tremendous suffering, to think through that message. But I once remember an article written um, in in our magazine by um, a a gentleman who was a former pastor in in in, um, in in Kaduna, and the article was called "Love is More Violent Than Terror." And I think I've referred to one to this article once or twice when he said that he held a gun when his church was being attacked, and he saw his family. And in the point of deciding that he was going to either live or die at the end of this, this God spoke to him. And so he, he wrote that article that love is more violent than terror. And I'll never forget the impression that article had on me. But right now it's it's um, question and answer time. So if anyone has, and thank you for withstanding the um, interesting technical issues that we face today. Um, it was very brave and very courageous of you to soldier on through all of that because you really did have a message from God for us. And we're really grateful that you managed to... Um, give it to us in the end. I wonder if anyone has any questions. If you have any questions, would you like to raise your hand? Um, um, it might be easier. Has anyone raised their hands yet, Bratunji? I haven't. Yeah, I can see. I can see somebody raised his hand. Oh, um, I haven't seen that. No, I've not seen it from my end. Yeah, sorry. I, I did. Okay. Yeah. Chair. Okay. Okay, John. Mr. Chairman has raised his hand. Can I have? Um, can we? Can we have your question, sir? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Mark, for 
such an excellent background to what's um, happening to us and the complexity of uh, the challenges uh, facing having reconciliation. Thank you for drawing us uh, back to the scriptures as in terms of our response. Um, what do you say practically to uh, the religions that believe that uh, if people will not convert, then they have to be eliminated? And right. when that we face that, uh, what should be our re response? Should there be any form of defense uh, to protect oneself? Uh, that's one aspect. Um, is it uh, not proper for us to appeal to uh, human rights? The type that Paul appealed to uh, in his time. Uh, he refused to be tried where he was going to be um, basically ex executed or by his own people. He appealed to Rome. So I just wonder how you place this. Yeah, actually, this is the exact picture of what is happening in Nigeria, um, where the violent form and belief of Islam was now taken on by some Muslims who I can say they were incited by the elites of Muslims for political reasons in Northern Nigeria. And it actually went on. Uh, we, we recall that it started with um, violence like um, rioting in, in, in cities where every uh, offense done to Islam or perceived offense done to Muslims, they take on arms and then they go burning churches and all that. And we remember the popular cartoon, uh, Danish cartoon that was designed that brought about violence in Northeast and killed a lot of Christians. Uh, I remember we went there with uh, Dr. Carling. Um, these were the approaches that were used uh, and uh, actually driven by the elite of Muslims to force people to believe. But we are here now where they feel that if you're an ethnic person or you're a Christian, you should not live in that part of the country, especially where they are most powerful. But then it has come to the point where, where does that leave us? What form of Islam is that? And we see a lot of Muslims falling victims. Why? Because they don't believe in their form of Islam that come with criminality, high form of criminal and human rights violations. And so even those ones have fallen victims and they have not been spared. So no one is saved. So when you say you must follow and become a Muslim, at the end of the day, what form of Islam do you lead Nigerians to practice? There is none. Today, I know a Muslim in Katsina that had to remove the roof of his, his house and sell it because the Fulani Muslims have demanded a ransom for his son that was taken away. And he came back to no house at all. So that is where we are going. That if you are strong and you can hold the best form of violence in Islam, then you should be the one to be listened to. But how many of those, how many of Muslims can take on to that? So it still leaves us comfortless, it leaves us without a solution in the country. So yes, when you talk about defense, defense is a right, okay? It's a right. But then when you look at to what extent can you carry out arms? I've met a Christian leader who has gone to be with the Lord today when he was attacked in the degree, bro, I4, Augustine I4, when his family was surrounded. And we say, what came to your mind? Didn't you think of defending your family? And he said, Brother Mark, how can I? When there are 300 people 
coming to you with the fiercest form of combination. <laughs> Any attempt to resist is like you are daring them. And they will look for the worst form of violence to put on you. And so surrender became the best form of defense for me. So this is what it is when you are to defend yourself. At what point do you do that? So those are the challenges of the time. Yes, human rights. We must advocate human rights. Human rights is what we call the righteousness of God. There is no right except that which is imputed by God. Can we succeed is another question. Because when people have taken on to violence, they don't think of anything. They see violence as the only way and it's winning. So we may never succeed, but gradually, when all their violent approaches fail them, the only thing that will stand is the right way we advocate as Christians. So there's going to be a time. Now the violence looks like winning, and so we cannot hold on to human rights. But no, some of us have been encouraged to continue to paint it, paint the rights of beings. Because that's what God wanted. And that's the only thing that will rule at the end of the day. So at the end, don't forget that every knee must bow and every tongue will confess that who? Jesus is Lord. And that is what God wants. Reconciling the whole world, all humanity to himself. And that's what we are called to do. We may not stop the violence. We may not uh, refuse to die. They may kill us. But yes, at the end of the day, even at our dying, they will learn that there is nothing that will win, nothing that can stand except Christ. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, sir, um, for, um, for the excellent response. I do see any more recent any more recent no. doesn't look like th there is any so um if, if sorry if there's if there isn't any let me follow up with uh, brother mark yes okay sir uh, because the, the the whole of the middle eastern area of the world became islamic because of uh, this forceful conversion of people and uh, turkey today we understand was uh, a christian uh, area before and um, by forceful conversion uh, they, they, they eliminated Christianity perhaps still exists to a very very minimal level and we see continuation of conversion of uh, 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 most Christian heritage uh -huh. uh, big uh, buildings that are being converted from uh -huh. um, what they were before temples of worship of um, the Lord through Christ into Islamic uh, mosques. Uh, don't you, should we not have concern that um, if we don't intensify the aspect of speaking to power mm. about human rights, mm. uh, in, each individual cannot defend themselves, but if the state is uh, brought to account mm -hmm. by whatever means so that people can be protected. Uh, mm -hmm. Should there be some effort along these lines or intensification of effort along these lines? Because we don't want to just become exterminated the, the exactly. way things happened mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Yes, exactly. Let me refer to the Middle East. Uh, you can, like you said, Middle East is turning Islamic and many uh, Muslims, are, Christians are turning to, to the faith, and even the traditional people in those Middle East are turning to the Islamic faith. Now, then you will ask yourself if Middle East is Islamic, why the uprising? Why ISIS? Is Middle East Islamic? Isn't, isn't it Islamic enough? Why Islamic State? Who are they fighting in that regard that people carry out arms and destroy nations like Syria, destroy the northern Iraq, 
and all the areas in that place. Why? It's because at the end of the day, the so-called Islam that is robustly uh, being turned to will not stand. It will not. When Nineveh, the popular uh, town that we know in, uh, in the Middle East, was taken over by ISIS, you saw the artifacts destroyed and a lot of uh, people were killed. We discovered that people were perplexed. The Kurds who were one in that environment were concerned. In our work of advocacy, both Muslim Kurds and Christian Kurds came together. At that point, all that matters to them is they are Kurdish. And so when we formed the mass and helped them to see how dangerous the Islamic uh, uh, faith, especially the, the, uh, the, the penal part of the Sharia is, all of them went back and pick up <coughs> arms to defend their area. We were told in our advocacy that it is even the Muslim Kurds that went and took on Nineveh and put a flag that this is Nineveh, a Christian town in the Middle East. So yes, we may be reducing in number, but it's not about number. It's about the righteousness. At the end of the day, what is right? So people are going to begin to look at not, no longer the belief. They only look at the right thing that stands in their belief. And that is what God ex expects us to advocate in these times. So yes, we may be concerned that our faith is dwindling. But it's not the number. It, it doesn't take God anything to change everybody to be a Christian today. And that is what it is. But God has given everyone free will. And that's the gift that he has given humanity. And he expects that human beings exercise that freedom to the point of making choices and make right choices. Because it will cost him nothing to make every humanity to be robots. But that's not what God wanted. He want people to come to the knowledge of truth and turn to it themselves. And so this is where God is going with humanity. And this until every human being come to that point. I think that this is right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Um, any more questions before? You have got five, four, three, two, one. Well, again, I'd like to thank you very much for um, Brother Mark Lipto for um, braving the elements and the technicalities. I'd like to thank you very much for your message. And um, I'd like to thank all of you who have been here today. Um, at the end of next month, on the last Sunday of next month at 8 p.m., we'll be back again. I'll send out the notices. Um, so please look out for that. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for being a very active participant in helping to resolve the technical issues that we had. Um, as the as the spiritual head of the OFNC, I wonder if you could just pray us out and then um, pray a blessing on Brother Mark Lipto and on everybody who has been here today. Thank you very much. God bless you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Father, we thank you because in all situations, you will not leave us uh, comfortless. And thank you uh, because you have given us your word to guide us, to lead us. And thank you because you ask us to meet together in fellowship so that we will encourage one another, uh, support one another, uh, sing songs of psalms uh, together in your praise. Lord, we thank you for what you have enabled us to hear tonight. Thank you for drawing us uh, to the heart of the scriptures, especially the Sermon on the Mount, about uh, uh, our response to those who are aggressive and intimidating towards us. We just want to ask, O oh Lord, for 
the help of your Holy Spirit, that our responses will be right at all times. Lord, we pray that your word will be true in our generation, that your church is marching on and the Amen. gates of hell will not prevail against her. Lord, we bring uh, before you all our brothers and sisters who are the forefront of uh, advocacy for your children. We pray, Lord, for your protection. We pray for your wisdom and we pray for your divine intervention. We pray, O oh Lord, that you send your host of heaven, even in defense at uh, critical times, according to your divine will. Lord, we do not want to Amen. deny your word that we will suffer uh, persecution. But Lord, we also want to uh, hold on to your, to your great commission to us, that we should go into all the world to make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and to let them know what your way is. Father, there are conflicts on the way. We pray, Lord, that you lead us to be effective in your hands. We pray that people will see the power of truth that comes from you. Thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ, because you said you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by you. We pray that this revelation will be known. Lord, even as we hear in uh, the Middle East that people have encounters with you, we pray that these encounters will be great in Nigeria. Lord, we ask for provision for all uh, ministries that are lifting up the banner of Christ. We pray, Lord, for your defense. We pray for your protection. We pray, Lord, that uh, their voices will not be silenced, but Lord, we grow louder and louder and not be uh, overcome by evil. We pray, Lord, for ourselves, Father, that we will Continue to be faithful in the calling you have uh, uh, given us. Lord, that in whatsoever way we can contribute to alleviate the distress of your people, we will do so. In prayers, in materials, and in words of comfort. Bless us, Father. Bless us, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us to stand on your side all the days of our life. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, all, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Brahma Klipto. It was wonderful. God bless you all for coming. See you again next month. <laughs>